In the second video, we're going to discuss the, uh, the W5 LET bare essentials transmitter uh, a little bit further, and we're going to actually build it up. Uh, we're going to very carefully test each section of the transmitter, and then we're going to uh, put the transmitter on the air and see how it operates. I wanted to discuss that many of the European plugs are not polarized. For instance, this Italian plug you can put it in this way, or you can put it in the socket this way. So line and neutral are going to get switched almost uh, indiscriminately. So it's a, it's a random event. So once you do find an outlet that you want to use the transmitter with, it's a good idea to mark the outlet or tape the connector onto the outlet so that it doesn't accidentally become dislodged. Okay, I'm about uh, halfway into the construction of the breadboard transmitter, the bare essentials transmitter. And uh, you can see I've got some parts which are not really soldered in yet. I've just laid them on the board to show the approximate locations. I promised that I wouldn't get into the AC outlets of the world, but I lied. I, I really have to talk about it a little bit. As you can see, here's the various uh, outlet plugs that we run into. And some of them are actually polarized, and by polarized I mean you can only plug them into the outlet in one direction. But the point is, don't trust any of them, because you don't know how your house is wired. You do not know that they have followed the standards of the particular country that the plugs are associated with. So we must assume that they are incorrect. That means we are absolutely going to check these plugs once it's connected into the system to make sure that we know where the line or the hot and the neutral and the ground are on the, uh, on the breadboard. And you can see the, uh, the basic uh, technique of driving the nails into the board. That seems to work okay. Um, I will note that I use nails that were a little bit too long. You want to use some shorter nails. And also, uh, once you put the nails in, you might want to hit them with some steel wool or fine sandpaper in order to make them uh, take the solder a little bit easier. I've mounted the tube socket and the crystal socket. Over here, we've got uh, an IEC inlet. Now that was stolen off an old ATX power supply, but that's a really nice starting point for building a safe breadboard system because it gives you a defined line cord that you're going to plug in that's appropriate for your country. Listen, I'm trying to follow a color code convention. For neutral, I'm using a blue wire. For ground, I'm using a green wire or a green-yellow wire. And for hot or line, I'm using brown wire. Okay, now we're closing in on the, uh, the final wiring of the circuit. By the way, you hear that noise? What the heck is that thing? That is a fan that blows away from where I'm soldering, and it pulls the fumes of the solder away from my face. Yeah, I just wanted to point out a couple things before we finalize this. This is the tank coil. As you can see, the bottom of the coil, closest to the chassis, closest to the board, is connected to the positive of the power supply. This is the RF cold part of the tank. So the bottom goes to the positive side of the power supply. The hot part of the tank, the top part, goes to the plate, or pin 7, of the valve. Okay. One more tip. As you can see, the link is down low. It's not in the center. It's down low, closer to the cold part of the tank. Finally, if you do obtain a conventional trimmer or patter capacitor, the side of the trimmer closest to the screw, 
okay, closest to the screw is the side that wants to connect to the positive of the power supply. The side furthest from the screw or not connected to the screw is the side that will connect to the plate. Now, a screwdriver still in contact with this will have high voltage on it, but it will not mistune the tank if you wire the trimmer in this way. Take one more quick look. Again, this is the basic transmitter with no real modifications other than the power supply switch, so it'll accommodate the 220. And as built, Also, I mentioned that uh, quite a few tubes are acceptable for this circuit, but do check the pin diagram before you hook up any tube other than a, a 50C5. You are observing polarity uh, with this system. The positive side of the electrolytics must be towards the red or the, the high voltage side. The band, the cathode band of the diode, must again be pointing towards the resistor, towards the circuit. So the current is flowing in this direction. Those are the three parts where polarity is critical. Okay, before I, I bring the system completely up, I'm going to run it on a 120 volt variac and bring the voltage up very gently from 0 to 120 volts. Then I will insert the uh, step-up transformer that brings it to 220. But before we've even touched the variac, and it's at zero volts, look what we see. Looks like we have a, a ground fault, and we haven't even started yet. What this is telling me is that somewhere between the board and the way the outlet is wired, we have a ground fault. Lesson number two. I have now connected the transformer between the variac and the transmitter. And notice that the light is still on. How can we still have a ground fault when we're using an isolation transformer? And the answer becomes very apparent when we read the transformer. And it says, step up auto transformer. Ah, an auto transformer is different than an isolation transformer. An auto transformer does not provide any isolation whatsoever. So I checked my outlets in the room to make sure that they were wired correctly. And the IEC plug, of course, plugs in only one way into these outlets. But notice that we have the alert light on. So we have a ground fault. And the ground fault is on our board. The only possible place where this ground fault can occur is either in one of the cords coming out of the wall into my variac or into the auto transformer or on the cord coming into the unit. So it could be the variac. It could be the auto transformer that steps up to 220, or it could be the cord. And if all of these check out, the only place the problem can occur basically the hot and the, and the neutral are switched right on the back of this connector. And I checked everything out, and that's where the problem is. So the brown wire and the blue wire need to be flipped. Also you notice there used to be a red device on the back of the inlet. This is a metal oxide varistor. Sometimes these are only for 120 volts so if you put 220 on them they will short out. Okay we're beginning to bring the board up now. We know we have the proper wiring on our hot and neutral with our connector and we need to set our AC voltage so initially I've got it set for around 
220 volts. Now the 220 volts AC is going to be rectified and you're going to end up with the peak of that voltage. There's no tube inserted and we're not closing the key, so the full voltage will be developed here. And this brings this brings a uh, another fault of the circuit to light. What happens when we remove the voltage? These capacitors are going to remain charged. Come in the next morning and somehow come across these, you're going to get a nasty shock of 300 you might volts. Notice I've added one more wire that we didn't have before. And that is the wire going from the AC hot down to the dropping resistor, which will light up the tube. And I've now inserted the tube. So the next test we're going to perform is seeing if we've got enough filament voltage on the 50C5. Also, notice I have a black wire between the 10K screen resistor and neutral. That was how I discharged these capacitors temporarily. I'm not really sure if the camera is picking up the fact that the tube is lit, but um, it definitely is lit up. I have a, uh, a probe right across the, the tube effectively from neutral to the end of the dropping resistor. And with 220 volts on the input, it looks like we've got 46.8 volts on the tube, which is certainly adequate to light it up. And if we raise our voltage to 230 volts, uh, I would imagine the, the tube will light up a little more, but it will be inconsequential. So I can already feel some heat coming off these resistors. You know, I can put my finger on it, but I don't want to leave it on there. It's pretty hot. Okay. But there's no, no problem with this amount of heat. So we will let this run for a little while and just make sure that nothing uh, overheats and there's no problems with the circuit. Right now, we expect to have full voltage uh, on the plate of the tube and we have full voltage on the filament of the tube. We've not closed the key yet. We're just going to let the, the circuit sit for a little while, make sure that everything is stable. Okay, I think we've passed the smoke test. Um, I've got the uh, 50C5 plugged in. We have a crystal plugged in. The frequency 7205. Okay, that's a good crystal to start with. Um, we've got 312 volts DC on the high voltage. And I have the coupling down towards the bottom of the coil. So we're going to we're keying. Let's look at the watt meter. About four watts. Okay, that's a good start. Now if we increase the tuning a little bit, remember this is hot, so don't get your finger on this thing. That's going to have some voltage. Okay, now we're up about five volts. Increase a little more. Nothing. We've gone beyond resonance. It's not oscillating at all. So we have to back it off. Okay, so you're going to find that on one side of the tuning resonance that you'll have quite a bit of adjustment. We can back this way off. See how it sounds better and better? At about three and a half, four watts, it sounds pretty good. As we get closer to the critical point, we get a little more power output. But the keying definitely goes down. Almost five and a half watts, and the quality of the keying has gone down. 
we can also fool around with the coupling and make that keying sound a lot better. So I think we're going to declare victory on the original circuit. I think we can call this a, uh, a qualified success. Not perfect, but it's doing what was promised by the article. That is a 4 or 5 watt output transmitter that's running directly off the line with no transformers. It's not burning up our crystal and we're running it safely. Okay, people are going to ask, how can I put the most power out from this transmitter? And I'm going to show you, basically we're going to short out R5, which is the 1K filtering resistor that is between C2 and C3. I've got a red jumper between the two. And now we're going to have very little voltage drop as we key the transmitter. And I would expect we're going to put out more power. Now, this is going to put more stress on the tube. It's going to put more stress on the crystal. And it may even crack the crystal. But I will expect that there will be a little more hum. The keying won't be quite as good, but we will put out more power. So let's take a look. A little over 10 watts. So this is about all I dare do with this kind of a transmitter. So perhaps a compromise value resistor of 150 ohms, a 1 watt, uh, might be something that you could run and maybe you would get 6 or 7 watts out, something like that. Okay, so this is how we can get a little over 10 watts from a single 50C5 off the 230 line. So I hope you've enjoyed this video on uh, making the W5 LET bare essentials transmitter uh, and we'll call this the, uh, the Euro version because it runs on 220, 230 volts AC, 50 Hertz. Uh, it's a very simple transmitter. It's capable of making contacts over thousands of miles. You certainly need a ham license to operate something like this. Um, in the next video we will talk about uh, legalizing this transmitter perhaps making it a cleaner sounding transmitter. We'll talk a little bit about emissions and uh, we'll add some more safety features to the to the device. But uh, I think this uh, represents a, a nice uh, morphing of the uh, of the transmitter into uh, something that might be uh, a fun uh, weekend project.